Today we're going to have a quick look at the span type in C sharp and specifically we're going to look at how you might be able to use that in place of strings and using substring. This is actually a video topic that was requested multiple times so this is just a reminder that if you leave comments on the videos and the content that I post I'm happy to put that content together for you. So without spending too much more time let's jump over to Visual Studio and have a quick introductory look at how you can use spans in C sharp. Okay, so what is a span? Well, I thought that this CodeMaze.com article on spans actually did a pretty good job explaining the basics. So I'm basically borrowing a lot of the examples that I'll have today from this site. So this code will be available online. And then if you want, you can go click this URL and I'll try to put it in the description as well. So you can go visit the site. So what is a span? Well, it's an allocation-free representation of contiguous memory. And you might read that or hear that and say, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, a way to think about what it's not and what it's replacing is, say, a substring is actually going to require new allocation of memory to represent a smaller portion of a string, right? So for example, if I highlight with my cursor here, let's pretend this is a string. If I said I want a substring and I want to take this part just to represent that substring, we'd actually have to go create a whole copy of it, whereas a span actually just lets us sort of point at this data and then we can give it a length. So the other way to look at it too is not just with strings, but with a arrays of data. You can actually do the same concept where you can point at the array and then say, I want this portion of the array. The other point to mention here is that a span is a ref struct, and this actually has a lot of constraints for where we can use them. So um, you, you might start noticing that as you're getting more familiar with spans and using them, you can't have them in async methods, you can't have them as fields of, of classes, and that's because a span is actually allocated on the stack. So I should add that here. Um, spans are allocated on the stack. So that's actually sort of the the limitation and actually one of the the reasons why it's uh, beneficial in terms of performance another constraint is that we can't use them in lambdas so if you have anonymous delegates and things like that um, you're unable to reference spans in those so again you may start to notice that you know you're like oh i'm gonna go optimize this algorithm i have it's going to be way faster um, and then because of the complexity of it you might start to realize well oops, like spans don't work here. But that's okay, because there's another sort of flavor of um, this span goodness, as I put it here. Um, but there's this memory type and read-only memory. And I should mention too that span also has a read-only span. But these memory and read-only memory work very much like spans with respect to performance and the abilities that a span has. However, the difference is that we can use them in a lot of these other constrained um, places where spans do not work. That's a brief introduction, but you might still be wondering, well, I don't really get it. I want to see some code. I want to see how it can be used. So we're going to walk through the example that's from this CodeMaze.com website and specifically this C-sharp post they have uh, on spans. And I'm going to also benchmark it for you so that you can see the benefit. So let's start by just calling out that I am going to be using benchmark.net, as you can see here. But I'm going to come back to the actual benchmark itself um, in just a moment. So let's not focus on the benchmark setup just yet. Let's get rid of that. Let's walk through a substring example where we're going to be counting the number of empty lines in a particular body of text. So again, this is borrowed from the code maze website. And what we're going to be doing is essentially looping through the text that we want to search character by character. And we're going to be looking for if you're on um, a Windows machine, it's a backslash R backslash N is a new line. Right, the two characters make up new line, and we're actually going to be looking for the backslash n. And then what we're able to do is try and see if we can get the um, the portion of that string. So we're using a substring to do that to represent the line that we're looking at. And essentially, if the line that we're looking at, so the substring that we take out, is exactly equal to environment new line. So again, in Windows backslash r backslash n then we know that we have an empty line and we can count it. And then this is just going to keep track 
and same with this variable, the bottom for the index that we're at. So this is a simple algorithm that just looks for empty lines, but it's using substring to do it. And as we'll see in just a moment when we compare the two algorithms, um, this is a totally functioning way to go look for empty lines, but let's go look at the span variation. So one of the first things we do in this method is actually take the text to search and get it as a span, which you can see here. This is just an extension method that gives us back a read-only span of this string. So this span now allocated on the stack is really just allocating a pointer to this string and a length, which is the entire length of that string. So this span itself is not a substring. It's really representing the entire string. Otherwise, the algorithm is almost identical, but where it's going to be different, if I scroll down a little bit lower, you'll see that instead of calling substring, we're actually calling slice. Now, what's really cool about slice is that unlike substring, slice is just going to give us back another span that we can look at. And because a span is just a pointer plus a length, we're not actually allocating an entire other substring. And you might be saying to yourself, well, if we're only looking at it line by line, like that's only going to be a small amount of text. It can't really be that bad, right? And to be honest, it's not really that bad in our current example. However, when you start doing this with a slice and then using spans, you'll see that it's dramatically better for performance. So like I said, the rest of the algorithm is almost identical, and you can think about slice in this case just being like a substring, except it's uh, the equivalent to a substring of a span without allocating more memory for that substring. So hopefully that sort of analogy makes sense. And let's go now check out the benchmark setup, and then we'll go look at the results of that benchmark. All right, so I'm not going to spend too much time explaining all the details of benchmark.net, but in this setup method we have, we're able to, I'm creating a random with a seed so that between our benchmarks we have the same data. And then we have this length uh, property that will dynamically be changed between our benchmarks. So I have a thousand, 10,000, and a hundred thousand text length for us to work with. And that's going to be the text that we're looking over. Next, this whole block of code in this while loop looks pretty ugly, but all that we're going to be doing is, because the first part of this just fills our byte buffer with random bytes, I'm just going to walk back over that byte buffer, and I, I set up basically a 10% chance that we'll drop in some new line characters as we're walking through, and then 50% of the time we'll double up the new lines, and that way we get empty lines. This I can also pull out and make a parameter if we want to see if there's a difference based on the frequency. And um, we can talk about this at the end, but right now I've just kind of picked these two completely arbitrarily. Um, and if you think about it, if you multiply these two numbers together, so 0.1 times 0.5, that's going to give us the frequency that we actually see empty lines. Otherwise, the only thing that we're doing at the end is taking that byte buffer and then making it the text that we want to search. So if you were to go look at this text, it's going to be completely jumbled up. It's not really going to make any sense. It's just random, you know, characters that we're putting in, sprinkled with new lines in between. And the whole point of this is just that I wanted to have a big body of text that I could work with. All right, so that's the setup. Let's go press play. I will edit this video so you don't have to sit through this and let's go look at the results. All right, so on my screen, I have the results. If you're not familiar with benchmark.net, this is just the output that we see from that program. And let's have a quick look at the columns that we have. So the method is going to be the different benchmark that we're looking at. Remember that text length property I mentioned? Well, we're going to see the variations of that here in the second column. And then we're going to focus on the mean, which is going to be our runtime, and then the allocated column, which is the number of bytes that we're allocating during that benchmark. So with that said, let's start right at the top with the first two lines that are talking about our first benchmark for substrings and then with span at a text length of 1000. If we look at the mean column for these two, the runtime for substrings was basically 2000 nanoseconds. So that compared to parse with span, the span was less than half the time. 
that's pretty impressive. And I mean, we're only looking at a thousand characters and we're talking about nanoseconds here, but it's half the time. So that's quite impressive. We'll see if that scales up as we start increasing the size of the string that we're searching. If we jump over to the allocated column, we quite literally allocated zero bytes to the heap, which is quite impressive. That means that we were able to do that substring variation using spans and allocating no bytes to be able to perform the same algorithm. Let's increase that text length by a factor of 10. So now we're looking at the third and fourth lines within this benchmark output. And we can see that, of course, the runtime for substrings has gone up by about an order of magnitude, so multiplied it by 10, right? And we can still see that parse with span is half the time of that. So quite interesting, right? As we increase the size of the text that we're searching, span still ends up coming out ahead in half the time that it takes the original algorithm with substrings. If we go to the allocated column, as we might expect, we get about 10 times the amount of memory allocated for the substrings, but we're still at zero bytes allocated for the span implementation. This is really cool. Now, the final example, I just put it at 100,000. You could obviously continue this pattern if you wanted to see it in more extreme cases, but decided to stop here. But as we see, another order of magnitude for the runtime but we're still at roughly half the time when we're using a span versus a substring. Again, jumping to the final column, spans still allocate zero bytes to the heap, and that is super impressive for us to be able to do a little algorithm like this and then not have to have garbage collection trigger on the things that we're operating on. So that's just a super quick look at spans and how you might be able to start using spans in place of substrings in some of your algorithms. And you can actually do the same type of things with byte arrays or other types of arrays as well. And I think maybe we can have a follow-up video looking at something like that. But the idea is very much the same when you're using arrays versus strings. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully you got to see some of the benefits of using spans in terms of the memory allocated and also the performance. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.